Welcome, heathens and witches, to the horn. And cauldron podcast. podcast. Pub chat, yeah. So we're back at it again, pub chat edition. Oh, late this week, but you know, not as not as late as the last Star Trek episode was late. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, <laughs> follow us over on YouTube, uh, where we do Star Trek reviews. And sometimes they're like a whole week late. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so either way, I've been John Norgrove. I am John Norgrove. You've this also is, been John Norgrove. I have been too. him. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe I'm new. Maybe I'm new to this. <laughs> maybe I'm that. Maybe I'm that cockroach alien from the first Men in Black movie. Bring me sugar salt, water. Me sugar. Sugar water. Water. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> anywho, uh, this is Julie Norgrove, and this is our witchy podcast. If you are listening to us on YouTube, don't forget to like this video, comment below, share this video with your friends, subscribe to this channel, and do all that kind of stuff. And if you're watching us on the podcast network of choice which would be impossible if you're listening to us on your podcast network of <laughs> I choice i mean i guess you could is, just be it looking been, at it as the time it has takes. been not long enough of a weekend for me <laughs> let me tell you yeah that. uh and this upcoming weekend is going to be whatever happens when nightmares have nightmares it's like a nightmare nightmare yeah yeah um it's a daymare as it were um but uh yeah so uh leave us a review that's how we know if you listen to us on a podcast network this is a pub chat so these are our short form episodes uh that are a little bit more user questions and story times and shows that we've watched and things like that yep. uh, so we're just gonna get right into it uh, today's pub chat is uh how can i help and um I, I don't know what that means. What's the question today? So um, <laughs> this How isn't so much of a user question as this is like a theoretical question that I am posing to us. So one of the reasons why this podcast is a little bit later than what we have been doing over the last like year and a half is uh, partially because of like trying to reacclimate ourselves to things as they change in our personal lives, but also um, kind of gathering our thoughts and understanding how we feel and what we want to say in light of some of the life changing political things that have been happening lately. Yeah. So this question political is really shenanigans. Yeah. This question it. is really with all the life changing political things happening lately, what can I do? And um, if you're listening to this when it comes out, this will probably be fairly resonant for you. Um, but if you're listening to this further away in time, really what we're talking about is we're talking about um, the rocks versus water yeah. thing. Yeah. And we're also talking about um, capital A avocados. Um, and yeah. if you don't know what that means, then you're going to find out. Yeah, you'll understand <laughs> contextually, but like- We have to be careful with the words that we use to describe this stuff. Because the system we live in bloody <laughs> squashes creators who mention the things with any degree of directness. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. So uh, let's jump into it. So <laughs> we've compiled a list of things that you can do to help. Some of these are more mundane and some of these are more um, witchy and heathen. So the first thing that you can do is vote. Vote in every single election. Do your research on the candidates first. They are purposely making it harder for people to understand and keep up with politics and what the platforms are so that you just dis get discouraged and give up. We've yeah. got to play the long game here. I know everybody's talking about it. So it feels a little bit, um, you know, like beating a, beating a dead um, Schlepnir, but um, you've got to do it. Um, what we have done in our family is we have had um, had had uh, had ballot parties. We live in a state where we can get them through the mail, and that's what we do. We yeah. vote via mail. Yeah. Um, so that may not be possible for everyone that's listening well, to this. Even, even if but, you can't vote during you know, through the mail, you can obviously look up the the ballots, positions, and peoples involved in your upcoming election. And then what my family has done for a long time, and this is just. And it's not, it's not about trying to convince you to vote my way or me to vote your way, right? That's not what this is. It's that if we sit down and we talk these things through, we can ask clarifying questions. We have the laptops right in front of us where we can do the research. And I can say, oh, I heard that this is the Shanann. And they can be like, well, actually. We all have dinner that's, together. That's we not the Shanann. This is the Shanann. Like, because, you know, such and such. Uh, media agency of predominant power has decided to manipulate the truth 
it, or only release certain information in a very specific way. And I understand that we were talking about this in very roundabout fashions, but this is something that we have to do in order to, um, you know, not get punished by uh, the virtual parents that don't want us to be informed voters. Exactly. So. Um, and if you're not sure what that means, um, there are a lot of networks, social media, and in particular, some of the platforms that we host this podcast and these videos on mm -hmm. that will punish us just for talking about it. Yeah. But we both strongly feel that this is something that has to be talked about, just like when we talked about the issues of racism and gatekeeping and our toxic internet um, witchcraft episode, which is a great episode. Definitely listen to it. Yeah. Um, we get a little spicy. Um, yeah. You know, these should, are people should be these upset. are things that people need to be talking about. So yeah. that's the first one. The second thing that you can do is donate your time or your resources. That's not always necessarily money. Sometimes that's physical, tangible items. There's a lot of ways that resources can go, but donate those to organizations that are helping people in need. Again, yeah. do your research. I mean, if you're a regular listener, you're probably used to us here. You know, used to us actually saying do your research yeah, before yeah. you do something this is another one of those moments so maybe we make that a drinking game too guys um and make sure that you're not getting scammed this is really important a lot of scammers come out when there are crises that are happening whether those crises are world events such as um you know wars or there are other types of more local events like disasters or yep. something political like this. Yep. Um, there are scammers out there. Do not give money to just some person who text messaged you. Be yep. careful of things that are on um, crowdsourcing websites like um, GoFundMe and stuff like that, because there are legitimate people out there that are asking for help out there, but there are also not legitimate people. And it can sometimes be difficult to tell the difference. Yeah. And, um, you know what? When in doubt, ask a friend. Yeah, actually, you know, um, just 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 go up to your friend and be like, "Hey, man, like I was thinking about donating money to this thing, or or, or I saw this offer, or whatever. I just recently had this happen, uh, where somebody came up to me and was just like, hey, like this offer came up, and like, like I, you know, I've had stuff like this before come up, right? And you know, for like content creation, and they're like, like, does this sound like sketchy, basically? Yeah. You yeah. know, and then we and then we just kind of like talked through it and it's just like, yeah, I mean, like it's it's like anything's possible. But this based on the information that you're giving and the information that I understand already, this doesn't sound sketchy. Like, yeah, another really home. great resource that a lot of people don't think about that I know about because I work in this sphere is if you're not sure if something is a scam, whether it has to do with 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 this or with something else, you can always ask your financial institution. You can ask your bank, you can ask your credit union. They all have fraud departments and they don't wanna see you lose money in your account either. Yeah. Um, and say, hey, I got this and I really wanna participate, but I don't know if this is fraud and I wanna make sure that I'm not getting scammed. And for the most part, they will be more than happy to help understand and do some of the legwork for you to understand whether or not this is a scam. Yeah. Um, they can't necessarily recommend that you give money to a particular place, but they can tell you whether or not something is a scam. So um, another thing that happens aside from scams is accidentally supporting an organization whose goals you don't agree with. Not only are scammers super tricky and like they know how to really just like work those heartstrings and are just close enough to like Amazon, <laughs> you know, is, is a good example, yeah. you know, yeah. um, like uh, to, to, to take advantage of you. But there are a lot of things, especially in the political arena that seem like they may be doing good, but they're not what you want. And in particular, um, something that comes up um, associated with, um, you know, rocks versus water here is um, potato crisis centers. Those are not clinics. Um, those are places that generally pressure a person to keep their potatoes, whether or not they actually should be keeping the potato if it's in their best interest. Um, so that's a really good example of, a, and that's not to say that they're bad, but many cases they are, they are not doing the thing that would be best for the person. Um, and another place that you really want to be careful about donating time or resources is internet activism. And there's a lot that we can say about internet activism, but really what I want to get across here is right now, there's a lot of posts that are saying, we'll help you camp, we'll help you drink beer, we'll help you go shopping if you need to come from another state. Hey, what's up? Um, and 
this is this is the social media equivalent of thoughts and prayers. While we while many people feel this way, they would help someone camp, you know, if they wanted to go camping and have potatoes um, or not have potatoes while they go camping. Um, it, it's not as helpful as you think it is. It is helpful so that people understand that you are an ally. But if you really are trying to help someone and they are in one of these positions where they are forced to be eating potatoes, then um, that may actually work against them um, because that can be used as a form of evidence against someone who's trying to get rid of a bunch of potatoes. Yeah. So it is yeah. a great thing for allyship, but there are probably other things that are more helpful for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if, you could if, also if get in trouble for helping. If, if you are in a position where helping somebody like that is a situation you want end-to-end -end encryption. You want to make sure that you're doing this without location tracking on your cell phone. When your cell phone is turned off, location tracking is still on. When your cell phone is in airplane mode, location tracking is not turned on, right? And even then, it's still even safer to turn your cell phone off and leave it at home. Uh, so there are a lot of things out there. There are a lot of resources, right? There are a lot of people explaining these things or uh, creating dead accounts to kind of get the information out there. Um, uh, and things like that. So again, do your research, like approach this from a, a, a good faith lo a, like situation, but also be aware of the fact that there are people trying to take advantage of this stuff. Yeah. So yeah, the last item on the mundane sort of list here is if you decide to go to a in-person meetup to talk about potato rights, um, you need to understand your rights. Uh, you need to know what to wear and what to bring with you and what is recommended that you do and do not do, especially when it comes to, you know, how you're acting, what happens if things turn south at this meetup. We saw a lot of really not great things happen at these in-person meetups in the summer of 2020 um, for different reasons, but there is no reason that you should not expect that that could happen to an in-person meetup. It is not to dissuade you from going to an in-person meetup, but please, please be safe. Know your rights, understand your safety, have a plan in case things go absolutely haywire. And yeah. above all, just be safe. Um, so Moving on to a bit more witchy things. One thing that I've seen a ton of people talk about is herbalism. And herbalism is not necessarily a witchy or pagan or heathen thing. However, many people that are in this space are also looking mm, at practitioners herbs and, and are practitioners or dabblers in herbalism. Yeah. Do not seek out, take, or hoard herbs that are used as abortifacants. This is incredibly important. I cannot say this in bold enough text. They are dangerous herbs, they are poisonous, and they often do not do the job entirely. These herbs are meant to jumpstart menstruation, usually by causing muscle spasms or by, in effect, shutting down internal organs. They are not meant to just expel. It's not like taking Ipecac syrup where you take it and it just makes you throw things up. That's not how these types of herbs work. There have been historical precedents for many cultures throughout the world using these herbs, even to current times. But unless you are trained and educated in the appropriate way to do these, it is just as dangerous as handing someone a coat hanger. Yeah, it's it's not, it's, the thing is, is that like um, herbalism with regard to this, a lot of topics, but especially this topic is one of those things where um, it's, again, left to actual medical professionals. Um, just because you saw a TikTok that said that, like, it, like you got to make a tea with some bullshit and you'll be fine is like real high risk. I'm going to be honest with you. It's think of it like mushroom foraging. Yeah. Maybe you're right, and that's the mushroom you think it is, and it's safe. And maybe you're not, and that's super dangerous and crazy, crazy poisonous. Yeah. Right? So err on the side of safety. Yeah. 
with regard to any of this sort of stuff, um, especially like herbalism or any sort of um, uh, like bonus medical accoutrement with regard to like a DIY solutions. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Um, we have like hundreds of years of history where it's just like this is a diy solution for the problem and then also come to find out it's like bananas dangerous um and the level between like a solution and like like toxic shock are like too <laughs> yeah. close for yeah. comfort we also you know, talk about like in our episode about um kitchen uh like kitchen witchery talking about potions about how many potions were purported to give people eternal life and they did that by killing them yeah so <laughs> it's gonna give you eternal life right up until you're dead because that's what mercury does to you that's called heavy metal poisoning yeah don't like it so um you can also look at casting spells or curses. There are a few avenues that you can take here, and we're not going to offer spells or curses for you. There are plenty of people talking about the things that they're going to do out there. And of course, as we've talked about in many episodes, saying it in your own words, in your own way, is the thing that's really the most important here, not trying to think of iamb iambic pentameter that rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you can cast spells to help people in disadvantaged positions. That is one way that you can do that. That is one of those like, and ye harm none kind of things. And that definitely will help, um, especially if your intention is there. You can cast a curse intended towards those in power. Now, that being said, we're not going to tell you don't curse. We're definitely not those people. If you wish yeah. to do that type of yeah, magic, we're not like all, all life and to light. You. No like, problem. Yeah. Like if, and if you don't believe. If you want to be sassy, be sassy. Right? Yeah. Like, and if you don't believe that people should do that kind of magic, that is your personal belief. Yeah. Uh, do not impose that on others. So if you decide to cast a curse at those in power, this is tricky because if something happens to one of these people in power, um, there's no guarantee that somebody better is going to take their place. Yeah. Uh, there are also a lot of people talking about how they're there's like covens that protect them with wards and stuff like that. And I'm not going to say there isn't, but I think that that is probably uh, probably not the easiest um, of the of the examples. Like, is it possible? Absolutely. Is it likely that, um, you know, these these devout people who are overturning laws and basically turning back the civil rights clock have a coven that's casting positive spells about them? Probably not. No. But we talk about in many episodes that the power of intention is important. And these people do have behind them lots of people Just who have a lot of thoughts, a lot and, of prayers thoughts and prayers about a bunch of About a lot of stuff. Shit. Yeah. So can you do the curse? Absolutely. Just be careful about how you word it, because remember, whether whatever the goal of your magic is, you want to make sure that you are making actionable affirmations that are concrete and that have a minimum chance of bouncing back at you. Yeah. So be be specific <coughs> in what it is yeah. that you want. Yeah, be specific and be careful. Yeah, exactly. Completely, Again, completely. be careful. Um, you can also cast spells to help people at these in-person meetups to stay safe or to let their voices be heard and heard louder. That is another way that you can do that. Um, as well as you can work with deities or pray to deities that are associated with women's health or laws. I have compiled a short list of these deities. Of course, you can always work with any deity that you feel more comfortable with working with. And if you hear a deity's name on this list, that you don't believe should be on this list. Again, that is your personal belief. I have selected these based on my opinions and understanding of how these deities work and the things that they are associated with. So Aphrodite is a deity that you can work with. She is a goddess of love and of pleasure. So definitely part of sex. Um, she's also a goddess of war. If you want to learn more about Aphrodite and that sort of particular aspect, we do have a deep dive on Aphrodite. She is my personal like patron goddess. So whenever I need something, I, I turn to her first. You can also uh, work with Athena. She is um, generally the virgin goddess, uh, but that does not mean that she does not have power in this arena. Mm -hmm. She is a goddess of law, of wisdom, and of strategic battle. We talk about Aphrodite and Athena and a few other 
gods and goddesses on this list in our um, Olymp- uh, Olympian family tree podcast as well. So if you're interested in yeah. learning more about some of that stuff and some correspondences yeah. for them, for the Olympian family that is tree. the good episode to listen to. Yeah. Uh, we also have a deep dive on the Dagda. He is one of these here. He is a Celtic god who is sort of the fatherly god associated with uh, many of the Celtic deities and part of the Denon. He in particular is associated with um, battle and doing what's right and cunning as well as winning out above all odds. Um, and he is loosely associated with laws and doing the right thing, but not as much as you'd think. Um, there is also Frigg. We talk about her as well as some other Norse deities that we're going to mention in a bit um, in our Norse family tree podcast episode. She is the patron goddess of mothers, of women, of wives, of girlfriends, as well as civilization. And if you think about it, civil rights is really a civilization type of thing. So she's someone that you can petition to as well. <clears throat> Following on the Norse side of things, you can also petition Hell. Um, she is a goddess of women's rights and of revenge. Yep. Uh, there's also Hera, uh, a Greek goddess. You can petition her. She is the protector of women and families, as well as, boy, if you want, if you want womanly revenge, Hera is definitely one of the tops there. Yeah. Um, you can uh, petition Isis. We have a deep dive on her. If you want to learn more, check that episode out. She is um, the, the mother of all. She's the patron goddess of, of women. She cares for everyone, but she also has a side that is a bit on the warlike side of things too, when it comes to repercussions for actions. Uh, Lou is another Celtic god that you can check out. We talk a little bit about him in uh, one of our Lunasa uh, 101 episodes, but um, he is a Celtic deity. He is associated with laws and truth and rightfulness and oaths. There is also Mat, an Egyptian deity. Uh, she is a protector of women and of laws also. Uh, we also have um, Maeve which is uh, spelt either M-A-E-V-E or M-E-D-B. She's another Celtic goddess. She's also associated with laws and rules and revenge and vengeance, women's issues as well. Um, Medusa, we talk a bit more about her in our Olympian family tree episode, and we'll be talking about her in a bit because she's part of our story time this time around. And she is a basically the patron <coughs> goddess of the modern feminist movement. So she is a great one to petition. There's also the Morrigan. She is the Celtic goddess of battle. <clears throat> and she is Savage AF, also um, the wife of the Dagda. Uh, Odin is another deity that you can petition to. He is a god of cunning and of um, words and poetry and writing. And he is sort of the father god of the pantheon of the Norse. Yeah, often associated with war or a god of war, um, as well as historically speaking, uh, Odin was, even though a male god, he practiced a predominantly female form of witchcraft um, through, uh, like, weaving, like, satyr, like, uh, weaving and, um, uh, like, weaving and wand work and things yeah. like that. Um, so he has a lot of association there. Yeah, we talk about him in the Norse family tree episode, but we also have an episode that's called Modern Odinism, where we talk a bit more about Odin in depth. Mm -hmm. um, there's also Tyr, the Norse god of laws and justness. Uh, and then lastly, and this is a bit of a controversial one, which is why I have the disclaimer at the front, and that's Zeus. Now, um, Zeus doesn't have the greatest mythos track record? and track record here. Yeah. And I fully, fully understand that. However, Zeus is the father of this pantheon. He is the father of women. He is the husband of women. He is the lover of women. And he is also the god of laws and rule and order and justice in the Greek pantheon. So um, if you feel that any of these deities resonate with you, definitely check them out. You can work with them to sort of help petition for assistance in this or guidance for what to do, all that other jazz. Um, but, and this is by no means a full list. Oh this yeah, sure, totally. Is... Well, and, and if, if, <clears throat> if, if a patron deity that you, uh, choose to work with doesn't directly like line up with this, but it's somebody that you work with, you can still look for them for help Absolutely. in a specific manner that, uh, that like indirectly correlates 
to you know the shenanigans that we're currently having to fucking deal with. Um, yeah. And before we leave talking about the shenanigans that we are currently having to deal with and move into the rest of it, which is story time and Magic Game Media, and try and finish with at least a little bit of lightheartedness um, in this otherwisely droll and dark podcast. That is not the way you use um, the word troll. <laughs> droll. Drool. Um, yeah, I forgot which word I was trying to use, and I just chose droll. Um, but, uh, whatever, man, I'm not, I'm not a words man. We're going to pretend that that's the thing. Uh, but, um, yeah, hey, you know, like we need to continue to have the conversation. We need to continue to be upset about this. We need to remember the things that are happening and have happened. And we need to understand what can be happening next if, uh, if, the path we're currently on continues, right? We need to become involved. We need to make our voices heard. And if nothing else, we need to make sure that other people know those voices that we agree with are also heard. Absolutely. Right? Like, you know, I, I never want to recommend like spending time in the like prison of scrolling through the internet. But like, if you see a, if you see a tweet, that that's that's got the stuff that you're that you're vibing on being said like that tweet Amplify share that, that tweet voice. yeah right so yeah you want to you want to try and and you know let's try and keep the conversation in the right path right there is going to be a lot of confusion there's going to be a lot of misdirection this is not going to be resolved overnight regardless of how much we try so we need to um Stay strong, stay vigilant, and we need to stay angry. Apathy does not solve these kind of problems. We cannot wait for the herd to 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 all of a sudden realize that this is you know uh, fucking insane or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we need to make sure that um, our opinions are are put out there, um, and we need to make sure that people know that the shit that's happening right now is uh, f- like really fucking not cool. It's very, yeah. it's very lame, and they need to know that this is, uh, this is bullshit. Yeah. So, and if you like us live in an area that is fairly well insulated from these changes, um, that doesn't mean that your voice has less, less, um, like less import. It doesn't mean that it's less powerful. It is very important for all of us to continue to have this conversation. Yeah. Otherwise, we will quickly find ourselves in a place in this country that we live in that is not only similar to The Handmaid's Tale and similar to The Hunger Games, but is also hunting pagans in the streets. Yeah. And if you're listening and if you've been thinking, we don't oh, need a religious oligarchy. Yeah. That's and if you've been listening to, to the conversations happening in the world, thinking, well, my voice doesn't matter. I'm only one person. Whatever that excuse is, your voice does matter. Yeah. And it is all of our jobs as modern pagans and modern heathens to continue this conversation, lest everyone around us rights are eroded and taken back. And we will find ourselves in the burning times again, if we don't. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, we need to, you know, like talking to, talking to people around town and, and, you know, the friends and such like that. It's like, we just, we got to stay angry. That's, that's the thing. We got to stay yeah. angry. We got to stay pissed off. We got to stay motivated and we got to keep letting people know that what's happening is bullshit. Right. We don't need to be uh, overly aggressive or violent. That's not that, that again, that's going to cloud the conversation. Right. But when you hear somebody and they're saying some bullshit and, and it's not on point, like you, you, you got to tell them, Hey, listen, that doesn't make any sense. Look at it this way, you know, help them to understand if they are wrong. Right. Because a lot of people may not fully understand what has happened or may have 
for a lack of better words, drank so much of the Kool-Aid as to not see the slippery slope that they've moved themselves onto. Or may have been given misinformation. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. if oh you, sure, certainly. The internet's a nightmare. Yeah, and if you <laughs> as a listener are interested in um, getting some resources, there are some resources that, um, that we have identified that we think would be particularly helpful. We are not putting them in our um, show notes and in the YouTube description because, again, we have to make sure that we aren't getting banned by these nanny by these like nanny entities by trying to help. So if you are interested in more information, hit us up on social media media, visit our website, shoot us an email, whatever works. We're more than willing to share these resources, but we have to do it in a strategic and smart way. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, and there are a lot of people out there sharing them in smart ways. So um you know, keep an eye out for that. Yep. Look for that stuff. Um, today, we are recording this on Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. Some of those resources were shared over the last couple of days um, by uh, popular uh, news uh, YouTubers yep. um, in the space. So uh, keep an eye out on those. A lot of people are sharing that information in a um, uh, concise and safely roundabout way. Yes. So so look out there. Uh, there is information and uh, there is hope and we will inevitably um, get these rights back. Yeah. Right. As long as we keep working, we won't lose. So let's just let's just keep hustling for a lack of better words. Yep. Right. All right. So that. Just mm, upsetting nonsense, fucking crap tastigry. Uh, aside, let's move into story time, shall we? So today's story time is about it's a shorter one, but today's story time is uh, a little bit of Medusa. Yeah. So uh, Medusa, as I mentioned earlier, it has been a sort of figurehead entity um, or mythos for the modern feminist movement. And um, if you don't particularly agree with the modern feminist movement, that's totally okay. That doesn't mean that you can't work with or understand more about Medusa. We're talking about Medusa today, partially because of that, um, but partially because it sort of fits the tone. So sorry, guys, this is not a very droll podcast. This is a bit of a heavy one, but sometimes you got to be heavy and sometimes you can be light. And that's really how it comes. So we're going to talk a little bit about Medusa. So Medusa is a Greek mythological figure. She is incredibly popular in pop culture. I actually have a Medusa tattoo. It is one of my favorites. I, I very much love her energy, uh, but it can be a really heavy energy and you have to kind of understand how to work with that appropriately. And bef uh, we have planned a full Medusa deep dive, but that is way in the future. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about her origin. So Medusa has um, some origin stories and many people are familiar with these origin stories because of some of the themes of the last decade and, um, you know, of, of her popularity. So Medusa really has sort of like three main origin stories, and I'm just going to run through them super quick. So um, the most popular of her origin stories are like these two, and they're actually the newer origin stories. So that is uh, Medusa um, was, uh, was assaulted by Poseidon. And that was in Athena's temple and Athena cursed her to be ugly because of this, basically, and yeah. to have the snakes and to do the, 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 you know, the, the turning into stone and all that other stuff. So that's one story. The other story is that Medusa and Poseidon fell in love and they had some sexy fun time um, in Athena's temple or in a, um, like a clearing in a sacred wood, which would also be sort of considered Athena's area. And Athena was so enraged by this that she then cursed Medusa to be snakes and, and, and ugly and, and stuff. Uh, and those are actually the newer of the, um, of the origin stories for her. The oldest origin stories for Medusa is that she was born as a Gorgon. So Medusa is a Gorgon, regardless of how she ended up becoming one uh and she had two sisters that were gorgons and um 
the older the older story uh, that dates that predates the the newer and more popular stories is older by like a couple of hundred years on paper or rock <laughs> yeah. as the case may be in vases papyrus or uh, <laughs> yeah vases and yeah such. so um basically medusa exists as a linchpin for perseus and it's interesting because medusa is sort of this figure where she exists to fulfill a very specific story-based need and that's for perseus to kill her using her own reflection and then to use her head as a weapon um to you know, get rid of bad guys, basically. It sort of depends. The Clash of the Titans uh, movie, both the old one and the new one, are not entirely accurate to the yeah. old Ooh, mythos. The new, one, the new one is not <laughs> great. If so, you're going to watch what, just watch the classic. The classic is orders of magnitude better. Yeah. 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 Way better. Yeah. So Medusa has a really interesting piece of this um, story. And that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about is that she's been um, used as this like allegory as a result of this for female power and for rage and for revenge. So it's interesting because if you think about it, Medusa is like, this being who was meant to be deadly, but then was killed by her own power. And now after death, she is affecting things in that nature. And yeah. I think that's particularly poignant to the things that are happening right now. And she's like deadly even after her death. Exactly. Which is, which is a very um, snake based thing. Yeah. Right? If you've ever like been on any of those sort of like, this is how you deal with snakes when you're hiking sort of like, yeah. ranger talks sort of a thing like that just because a snake's dead doesn't mean that it that it can't still get you exactly you know yeah, yeah yeah um so yeah and in a way she's kind of like ancient greek mythos lady john wick yeah um because the only person who was able to figure out how to kill her was perseus and that was actually with the help of athena whatever beef athena had with medusa yeah, yeah. you know depending on the story that yeah, you're, yeah. That you're and, reading and, there. and you know there's there's a lot of I would go with internet drama about which story is the truest story about whether or not her and Poseidon's situation was or was not, um, you know, consensual, uh, consensual. Yeah. Um, uh, assault with a capital R, as it were. Um, so there's there's a lot of opinions out there on that. Um, I feel like TikTok is probably like the most opinionated space on this right now. Yeah. I have seen some TikToks where they're just like, like lies and shenanigans. This is the real story. And you're just like, why? Like that coming in real hot with that. And then other people are just like, well, I mean, it's probably this or that. And, you know, I've even seen like, well, uh, it sounds like she was uh, basically a, like, uh, a character that needed to exist for a story to continue. Yeah. That has sort of like developed into its own like side quest cult. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that later on became like a deity that's worshiped and things like that. Um, but again, that was a long, long time ago and we don't have like, you know, like we weren't there. We don't, Unless we don't have, you were there, we don't have like and you're Plato some sort of like immortal being like, vampire. This is how I heard thing. about this first. Blah blah blah. Yeah, blah. Yeah, Here yeah. are my resources. You know. Well, and and part of that, um, and this just doesn't go for Medusa, but this really goes for sort of like all of the old mythos. Whether you're talking about the Greeks or you're talking about the Norse or anything, anything, anything. really is, um, you know, that's just that particular writer's. Um, story or that doesn't even mean that that's their interpretation TikToker. of the story. Yeah. Um. You know, if you've ever read a book and watched the movie, or vice versa, watched a movie and read a book and gone, "Hey, this is not what the book has." Yeah. Um. Or seen a remake of yeah. a movie that is beloved, and you're like, "That is way different than the original." You got to remember that people have been movie doing remakes. that throughout time. Yeah. So it's the telephone <laughs> game, right? Yeah. Especially when you're going that far back, you have to think about the telephone game. We all did it as kids. Uh, we all understand what that is. If you don't know what the telephone game is or if it has a different name in uh, your country or location and it's not called the telephone game. We're in California. That's what it was called when I was a kid. Um, is where like somebody has like a like a secret phrase 
and they say it to the next kid and the next kid whisper, whispers it to the next kid and, and down and down the line until the whole classroom, it goes through the whole classroom. And at the end of the classroom, the, the last kid goes like, this is what the secret is and says it out loud or whatever. And um, then, of course, like the original secret teller is like, this is actually what the secret is. And everybody's like, ah, it changed. I Like, I don't know if kids still play that. But honestly, that is, I think, a formative and required and necessary lesson yeah. for children to learn <laughs> is that when a bunch of humans have to repeat the same thing. And it's not like you're you. It's not it's not like the catchphrase is 14 numbers. Right. It's it's generally something fairly innocuous and simple. And even that, it changes. Yeah. And it never changes with like in 10. I mean, like, you know, whatever. Maybe that kid over there is an asshole and changed it on purpose. But like, that's statistically unlikely. More often than not, it's just that people that we don't remember with perfect accuracy. We don't yeah. repeat with perfect accuracy. We don't hear with perfect accuracy. And so things drift. Yeah. You know, absolutely. this drift in logic. And whether that applies to interpreting the things that you hear on the internet and passing those along to other people, or whether that is uh, interpreting practice or deity work or um, religious texts or anything to that nature, and then coming to conclusions based on the thing that you seem to think remember reading because somebody else said that they heard it, when you come to find out when you open that book, it doesn't actually say those things. I don't know what you're talking about. Go read the book. It's not that hard. It's in every hotel room. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, because it's infuriating to me. But um, so, yeah, it's again, like, remember the telephone game. Remember the lessons learned from telephone games as children. Um, and, uh, you know, if your particular Medusa is X, Y, or Z Medusa, then that's your Medusa. And that's fine. Yeah. Right. And above all, remember that when we talk about deity work and working with deities and why we're working with them or even herbs, all the correspondences that we talk about, what we're talking about is we're talking talking about the archetypes behind why you would use those. Yeah. And that's really what we're getting generalization into generalization and and always and also our interpretation, because if it's sub coming out of somebody's mouth then it's their interpretation, even if they're reading off a piece of paper. They're adding their flair. They're adding their, you know, their emphasis on the right or wrong syllable, as it were. So, like, <laughs> I mean, th th that's the thing, man. It's, it's like, I can read a book, you can read a book. We're going to take different shit from that same book. It's one book, right? It don't matter what it is. Yeah. That's just the way that that works, right? Humans interpret things. We, our, we live in a reality that is our interpretation of the information being fed into our hallucinating mushroom. So, like... You know, keep that in mind. And, um, you know, it's it's that it's that like, uh, you know, keep a little salt with you just in case sort of a situation. <laughs> right. Believe everything but with like a little bit of salt around it. Just, you know, just in case spoops. So, <laughs> what is that? Spoopy shit? A little salt. All right. It's probably less spoopy now. So, yeah. Um, all right, so next up, we're going to move right into Magic in Media, and this time we are specifically talking about Love, Death, and Robots Season 3, which we just finished, I don't know, uh, like a week ago or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, this is sort of the lighthearted part of this episode. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, in particular on Love, Death and Robots, um, if you have not watched it, it is on Netflix. It is a bunch of short animated um, stories um, dealing with love, death and or robots. Um, and you may be thinking, why, why robots? Why love, death robots? But there's a lot of stories in there that are quite interesting that have to do with mythos and mythology in particular. I wanted to talk about the what uh, Jabaro. Yeah, the last one. The so, last okay. one. Before we get into Jabaro, what we're going to do is I'm just going to I was going to kind of speed through these and just kind of hit on like what each what we what each episode is about yeah. without like not not really spoilers or anything. But like assume that that if you haven't seen this and this is something that you want to go into cold turkey, that there may be a little bit of spoilers. So the uh, volume three, season three. Uh, starts with the three robots exit strategies, which is basically just about the technological, ethical, and moral irresponsibility of humans and us destroying ourselves and our planets. It's poignant, obviously. Um, <laughs> episode two is bad traveling. This is basically like um, Ahab, but he's a shitty guy. Yeah. Right? Um, although I guess in the end, he's like, maybe not that shitty. I don't know. It, 
It gets very it needs depends of the, on your it gets very needs of the mini yeah. outweigh the needs of the few <laughs> Spock thing. Um, so, but it's very interesting, yeah. and all of these also have like different artistic styles. So, like going to that, uh, the very pulse of the machine is um, mm, cosmic cosmic acid mancy. Yes, right. It's um, it's the veil thinning as one approaches death and uh, transcendence upon that, yeah. uh, which is super fascinating, and it approaches it from. Um, from non-mechanical machine logic, which is nice. Uh, Night of the Mini Dead is literally what it sounds like. It's just Night of the Dead, but very tiny. Uh, it's good. Yeah. Uh, Kill Team Kill is... Um... Oh, Kill Team Kill is... <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to think about that. I'm sorry. That just had like a little stroke. I was just like, is it this one? No, it's not. Kill Team Kill is basically like a... Uh, uh, man played God too far, and now a bunch of dudes have to deal with it and and stop that from getting yeah, horrifying yeah. everywhere. Uh, it's very funny. It is. Oh yeah. my god, I love that episode. It was good. The Swarm, or the episode's name is Swarm, um, is about our ability to play nice with others, um, and how we're not great with that, and we're manipulative and taking advantage of the uh, perfect balance that is nature. Um, yeah. And how no matter what we do, inevitably we will disappear and uh, nature will repair itself, but it's going to be real pissed, uh, you know, during. Yeah. So deal with that stuff. Also, beautiful episode. Oh, my God. They could turn that one episode into like 10 seasons and I would there would not be enough answers. given. So. Yeah, agreed. Um, agreed. After that is Mason's Rats, which is, again, um living alongside nature uh through a look of uh the battle with uh like what we are what we perceive as vermin and like the evolution of thought at what point does something is something sentient have value and can be worked with instead of eradicated um it's very cute um a bit violent it's extremely violent i lied it's, it's probably the yeah. most violent of all the it's episodes. super gory it's the most violent and there is an episode where people are getting torn apart by a cybernetic bear and this one is more violent <laughs> so yeah uh that i was just like holy shit yeah um but yeah uh and then after that is in uh, in vaulted halls entombed which is just straight up cosmic horror lovecraftian cthulhu shit solid gold if you're very like old gods like cosmic horror you know what watches from the shadows sort of a person this is going to be right up your alley absolutely i yeah. loved this episode and then the last episode of the season and the episode that we're going to talk about is jabaro which is sort of a um it's a it's a it is a siren episode. It's a it's a nature's sirens being taken advantage of um and stolen, you know, it's the purity of nature being stolen by the greed of man. Yeah. Right? And how nature uh rebels against us um and fights against us to try and um again protect that balance, protect that value um that nature has. Yeah. I thought this one was particularly interesting. Um, because usually when you see the concept of sirens in pop culture, you're looking at more like the sexy lady type siren, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're seducing, um, they're, you know, the, the unwary, the, the unwitting travelers, you know, to their area. And I felt that this one was interesting because it takes a little bit of a different thing. So is this a, like a beautiful, sexy creature? Yes. But um, it appears that the drive to to um, to the the drive that sort of puts the main character in this episode under the siren spell is not lust, but is greed uh, and really the lust for greed. So they are both yeah, there. Yeah. There is some assault stuff happening. It is a um, in its own way. It is a truly heartbreaking story. It's a pretty dark. Um, episode. It's, this it's is a very dark. This is a, this show. Is a dark show yeah. um, filled with existential questions and thoughts. But I really loved their treatment of the siren in this um, because it is so different from what we normally see in pop culture sirens. Yeah. Often the siren 
I feel like often in modern media, the siren is like, is very like, look at this sexy mermaid. And then like the camera does like a quick pan and she turns and it's like hagfish, you know, yeah. with the Chops. like, with the like, with the like sharp teeth and the like droopy glowy light and like extra gills and stuff. And it's just like <sighs> angry, you know, yeah. like, like it's like they, they, they play a very like, um, I mean, really like a very sort of reductionist, simplified version of that. And in this, the Siren's Draw was not a loving song by a beautiful, you know, like a like a fair maiden on a rock. But like the song itself both drove the drove the men towards her, but but also killed them in the process and yeah. was like undeniably and drove them mad, death for sure. and madness and all of that stuff. And it almost seemed like that song played specifically against grief. Yeah. Which is interesting, right? Um, like it, it didn't feel like that like like she was trying to lure them into some sort of a trap, but it felt like um like their greed marched through like her space, right? Like they marched through her her like woods, her her lake, all right, and and her defense mechanism was to draw them in and drive them mad. Yes. Right? Um, there's a very, very interesting art style and utilization in this. Um, it's a very pretty episode um, with amazing sound design. They also used a lot of motion capture to yeah. create the dance movements yeah. from the siren, um, which I thought was super interesting because it almost looks... It, 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 it's it's done in a way where it looks like it could be human, but it's just past that, slightly past the uncanny valley and pushes it just a tiny bit inhuman. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. The, there's uh, both like physical features, but also movement. It's that um, uh, like when you're using uh, like contortionists in movies to achieve yeah. that like very traditional like... Um, I would consider Raimi-esque horror body movement. <laughs> yeah. You know, like early Raimi horror body yeah, yeah, movement yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, so, yeah, I, and they did a really great job with it. And and it really showed, like, because it, it, it very much presents the, like, the loudness of greed that mankind brings with it into the stable uh, ecology of nature and how uh, nature's response to this her response to this um, is is a loudness, but that takes that greed and drives it into madness, yeah. right? And and it, 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 there was a there were there were a lot of nice interplays with regard to like sound and symbolism and like um, like both set and setting choices, yeah. With regard to like the way that they acted, uh, this was a this was a really really good episode and. I, even though this is what I would consider primarily science fiction, this series, yeah. Love, Death, and Robots, is primarily science fiction. I think that it's still, um, it still has lessons. It's just not like G.I. Joe, where like at the end of an episode, you know, one of the Joes stands on a screen <laughs> and it's just like, well, did you know that this is bullshit? Don't take Doo -doo 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 -doo. candy from Strangers. You know, yeah. the more you know, like it's not, it's not that. <laughs> It's just like you're going to watch an episode and then be like, it's going to be like, you want to watch the next episode? And you're like, hey, Netflix, pause for a second. All right. I'm going to take a lap. Dude, what the yeah. fuck did I just watch? Yeah. Right. Um. So, yeah, this was this was yeah. a, a very magical episode. Yeah. For me, this episode is is definitely going to live rent free in my head. This not only not only really sort of changed the way that I think about the siren aspect of things. And, and not only do I love the animation style and I absolutely, I mean, you guys know how much I love the costuming um, stuff. <laughs> I absolutely adore what they did with this costume for this particular, um, the siren creature. Um, but it, it makes me think slightly differently about protective water spirits. Yeah. So we talk a lot about on this, on this podcast about the Fae. I work a lot with the Fae. And to me, this is a very Fae creature. Yeah, this is this is definitely very Fae adjacent. It's very siren adjacent. Yeah. It's it's um I from my perspective, it's very a lot of things adjacent. It's to it feels very original, but very rooted in like 
um, easily recognizable cultural like uh, ideologies. Yeah. Right. That allow us to sort of like like immediately get like, oh, yes, I understand. Without it having to just be like, this is this thing and this is what it thinks. And this is, yeah. you know, it's very, this show, uh, overall, all three seasons, but especially this episode, is very show, don't tell. Yeah, absolutely. And they do a yeah. great job of showing and not telling and still having you ask yourself on the inside deep, poignant questions. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, absolutely great. If you have not seen Love, Death, and Robots, Fucking highly recommend. It is not um, serialized. So you don't need to watch season one, episode one through season three, episode 10 yeah. to be able to get to Jabaro and watch it. You just jump right into Jabaro tonight. It don't matter. Yeah. You jump right into, into season two, episode five tonight. It don't matter. They're all individual. Each episode has a different art style. So if you start an episode and that art style is like not your jam or whatever, then like that's also fine. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's man. It's such a good show. Uh, every time I think about it, I basically just want to rewatch it from stem to stern. It's just it's just one of them thinking shows. It's yeah. Good. It, it, you know, it's uh, entertaining, it looks gorgeous, and it really makes you sit back and ponder um, those questions. I mean, most of those questions are existential dread, which is a bit millennially, but um, <laughs> I mean, it's fair, right? Yes. What else do we have to do except existentially dread stuff? Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know, whatever. I'm, I'm real pro existential dread i guess so <laughs> yeah I, and there I are other it. episodes that i think definitely work as far as looking at them from like a pagan heathen spiritual witchy kind of aspect oh but God, this yeah. one is just what we recently watched and the other thing we want to talk about in magic and media fairly briefly is we're going way where we went from like future sci-fi to like we're going way back in time we recently watched a local production um at the theater called the tempest and this is shakespeare's the tempest we are both familiar with this and have seen it before um and um we just got to give a shout out this was a wonderful production oh, so cool, um, if dude. you live oh. local to northern california sonoma county um the town that we live in monterio has a playhouse and they are fully volunteer uh and they do really really amazing work and that's where we saw yeah. this in a tiny tiny intimate theater setting and i gotta give a shout out to the magical things about the tempest the tempest is all about like there's there's like a there's like basically a witch who was shipwrecked on an island Meow. and yeah, yeah. <laughs> abandoned there i'm doing i'm doing ship, i'm doing a dirty tldr sh ship abandoned and there. she's got like a daughter but it's not technically her daughter that was that was also shipwrecked and abandoned and then there's another ship that she sort of caused to be shipwrecked and abandoned through the tempest through yeah. the tempest she is basically a witch who is who is who is creating storms through her magic yeah. she is able to interact with and control air spirits and yeah. water spirits. And in doing so, she has created a servitor, which is like a sort of like a, a creature that is made of fish and men. It's not entirely clear. It's Shakespeare. What do you expect? Um, and there's a lot of magical things. She puts people to sleep. She controls their mind. She has illusion spells um, for her. There is love magic that is done. Yeah. Um, it is a fantastic, fantastic play. And um, if you are at all interested in Shakespeare and have not seen The Tempest, definitely check it out. There are a few movies that that do The Tempest either directly as Shakespearean or sort of take it and plop it into other um, other other like, like genres settings and genres, settings. Yeah. depending yeah. on how you like your Shakespeare. Everybody's yeah. a little bit different yeah. there, um, but it is highly- Do you like your Shakespeare like on the beach with guns that say sword on it? I am into that. <laughs> I am. Uh, you it's know, a good movie. A lot I'm, of people, I give it shit, though. like Shakespeare Tangent, a lot of people hate on Romeo plus Juliet. I love it. It's a, I it's a good movie. was a theater kid. Wow. 
and I have no problems with Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare in the old timey way that it was like originally written, but I also love new versions of Shakespeare. Yeah. And you know what? R plus J is so beautiful in the way that it is done. And also it has John like Wazamo in it. It is Shakespearean in there tone so and many, logic, so many but modern items. in set and setting, which is fantastic. It's a, it is, from my perspective, it is such a great example of how to do a like remake of a of a of a story or a movie yeah. where you make it your own, right? I think often, especially nowadays, we get this like uh, we get this like um, like you remember that you liked this movie. What if we just redid it and then they redo it and they do like too close to the original and not enough with their own themes and they make a few changes and they're like, look what we did, and you're like, hey. This is awful. Why yeah. did you flip and do this? <laughs> what the heck, guys? And they're just yeah. like, oh, I don't understand. But because everybody watched it and that's how they judge their their success, they're like, what if we did it again? And you're like, I don't know why. why are you you're like, what if we did a sequel? Yeah. And you're like, please don't. <laughs> Live action cartoon movies. What are you guys doing? You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, Capital D. Anyway, so those are the things that we recently watched with Magic and Media. Yeah. Um, have you seen these? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Are you also a Shakespeare theater kid? Yeah. What is your favorite Shakespeare play? Mine's Macbeth. Um, <laughs> um, you know, let us know. We also have plans to bring you like standalone episodes. These will be primarily done on the YouTube channel with uh, visuals associated with them that are deep dives into things that we have seen as like full length episodes yeah. of Magic and Media. We're very excited to get to do these and um, it's going to take us a little bit of time to get there. Fingers crossed we get the time to be able to do them. Um, <laughs> so we've so, definitely yeah. got that coming. We know that we said that we've got project videos and Magic and Media coming, but they are coming. This is not our day job, although we greatly wish it would be because yeah. we love our audience yeah. and we love producing this content. So if you would like to help us produce this content, please, please check out our Patreon. It helps us to do what we do a little bit better every single time. Yep. And um, speaking of which, shout out to our patrons, Alan, Miranda, Alexa, Helena, and Adrian. Thank you so much for supporting you guys are us. Awesome. You are awesome. Yep. We love you. And we appreciate that you let us do this thing that we super love doing. Yeah. And uh, next up, uh, we have our next episode will be episode 42, which is a deep dive into Freya, uh, which should come out just after the uh, 4th of July. And then our next pub chat like this is going to be the week after that. That'll be pub chat number 11. We're yep. moving on with these pub chats, guys. Uh, so submit questions. If you have any questions that you want us to like take a look at, or honestly, if you have something that you want us to like story time into or anything like that, uh, media you want us to watch so we can talk about it, uh, let us know. And uh, you can comment in the dibbly doo below. You can hit us up on social media, whatever. It's all out there. I have a a form a submission form on the web page if you wanted to do it that way and send an email um so <laughs> like fancy. yeah whatever whatever you guys want um let us know and then you know we'll we'll, we'll uh put those on the list and and get to that stuff because we enjoy hearing uh from you guys yeah uh but yeah either way i've been john norgrove this has been julie norgrove this has been the horn and cauldron podcast pub, pub chat chats. and uh we will catch you guys next time um, like I said at the beginning, don't forget to like this video, comment below, share, subscribe, ring the bell, leave a review if it's a podcast. And um, yeah, stay magical, folks. Yeah, thank you for staying with us. And don't forget, breathe in self-confidence and breathe out self-doubt. Mm -hmm.